Okay, so the, the last of our talks before we have a, have a short break is uh, Inez Mendes, who is a PhD student in Mario Ramirez's uh, lab at University of Lisbon in the Institute of Molecular Medicine. Uh, Inez does lots of great work on metagenomics uh, and reproducibility, especially workflows, which I'll talk about a little bit during, uh, during the short kind of practical run through demo. Um, and they're going to talk today about sort of, okay, so we have, so one of the problems, and as uh, Dr. Felgarden raised, you know, there's a lot of AMR tools and they all have different outputs, but you might want to also compare them uh, and compare their performance to see what works best for your particular data and your particular problem. So one of the solutions to that is something called harmonization via phage, which Inez has done a lot of great work on. Uh, so they're going to talk about that today uh, for the next, and then again, questions and answers after, question, answer, discussion afterwards. You got any questions, stick them in the Q&A. Take away, Inez. Thank you very much, Finley. Uh, please tell me if you can see my screen. Yep, clear as day. Yeah. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for the organizers for inviting me just to be here. Um, thank you all for participating in this uh, quite amazing initiative. Um, and thank you, Finley, for introducing me so well. Again, I will be talking a little bit about our pet project at uh, the FAGE uh, Data Structures Working Group called Demonization. Uh, and as a refresher, Emma Griffiths introduced uh, FAGE incredibly well, so I will not dwell all on on this initiative, but basically is a global coalition that aims to improve openness, interoperability, accessibility, and reproducibility uh, in public health microbial bioinformatics. It is composed of a lot of working groups, each with their own focus, uh, and I'm part of the data structures. And this is where this project is actually uh, coming from. So Emma is our chair. Um, we work a lot with data standards and standard standardization of data, uh, which sounds kind of scary and very troublesome. Uh, it sort of is, uh, but it's also incredibly rewarding. And again, we have two main projects right now, the SARS-CoV-2 contextual data specification. But here I'm going to present to you our gen, uh, gene detection and IM, MR output specification and what arose from that, which is the harmonization software. So the AMR, uh, I couldn't have done a more thorough introduction that our two last speakers did. Uh, there are a lot of databases. There are a lot of tools. Um, but I think the main point here that I want to bring to you is that different tools going to have different outputs. Um, so they can differ in types of input. They can differ on the types of output they provide. There is a bias and caveats present in each of them that should be interested. So in fact, there is kind of a communication barrier between the Upwork genomic workflow that actually allows you to predict uh, whatever AMR you're, you're reporting to the users are actually going to act on that information, either in public health on clinical uh, or one health approaches. So again, there's a lot of ways you can approach this problem. Uh, couldn't have done a better introduction than Dr. Michael. So you can have as input either raw reads or assemblies, each come with their own caveats. You're gonna have your all a different uh, AMR genome mutation database, um, but usually you can also have a myriad of, select, of choices on what bioinformatic pipeline or tool you can actually get. So in the end, this is going to influence uh, the, the output and the report that you're gonna have for your particular sample, either metagenomics or um, an isolate sample. So for instance, here I ran uh, the same genome on several tools. And here I have the report from Abricate. Uh, using, I think, RestFinder database. And it's a tab file. Arima Finder Plus, again, another tab file, which we're already seen from Dr. Michael. Um, Ariba, which is yet another method. This is guided assembly type of um, predicting AMR resistance. Gives a TSV file still, but completely different structure. Uh, and lastly, SRST2, which is yet another using sort of a REST finder-like database, 
also reported ESV, uh, but also the structure is incredibly different. So here we are faced with the problem of having reports that have different structures and how do you map what is in one and what is in the other. For example, Michael mentions the problem of what actually is the gene symbol or the gene name and are they the same and what, where are they in these tables? So this requires a lot of manual creation and manual input. Uh, and here we can actually see that we have here a table of gene, another one here of gene, and they have completely different names and structures. Yet again, they might use different databases and this can influence uh, the results that you have. Um, so first message, there's a small number of AMR databases, sort of, um, relatively speaking, but there's a lot of software which predicts the AMR, but outputs uh, the results in different formats. Um, and if we're talking about the fair data principles, we want our data to be findable. They are, databases are available, the tools are available, most parts are open source, uh, accessible to anyone, interoperable, meaning that we can actually have fake meaning from one to the other, and our results can have meaning for in whatever concept they are presented, and then they can be reused by the community or the people that are going to take action on those results. Um, so first take home message of the day, the lack of standardization is the in the reporting of the AMR gene detection hinders the comparison of results across public health sector. This is, has a major impact on the actions that you can take from your reports. It, it shows that we have a grave interoperability problem. So this was our first task we wanted to tackle at the FAGE uh, working group. So we developed a standardization. A specification actually standardizes the output of a myriad of different tools. Uh, I think we have 14 at the moment growing. Um, when, and we defined what would be one, the minimal information that is required for that information to be useful, and how can we harmonize the various reports that we get from different tools into one singular format that, that can be shared um, worldwide. And we can actually compare the results from one software to the other, or from one database using a, a software with the same software using another database. This is actually the main question here is that we can have a myriad of options, uh, but comparing them is not straightforward unless you have a common ground to, to do that comparison with. We define mandatory terms, which we, we say is the least information that it's required. Uh, and this is very, very small. So we have the database that you're using the version of the database that you're using because results can change from database to database, uh, the software name and also the software version. Again, results can, can change from one iteration to the other of a tool. Um, we're gonna have uh, fields like gene symbol, gene name, sequence identity, uh, what is the reference session? What is the sequence length of the reference, target sequence length? And there's going to be some fields that are present in some reports that are not present in the other, depending on the type of data that you're inputting. If you're using reads, the type of reporting that you're gonna have is going to be very different. So you might be talking about coverage, for example. Um, whereas um, when we are using context, you're actually blasting against a reference database. I want to know, okay, if this is my reference, how much of it is actually covered? So instead of the depth of coverage, we're going to be talking about breadth of coverage. Uh, so those terms are part of our specification, but they are not mandatory. So the idea here is that you're gonna have a report of tool X, of tool Y, and of tool Z. And because we have this standard uh, specification, we can actually map the fields of each one of these reports to our own format. And then we can have a comparable report that then we can have, we can take information out of. And we can actually say, what is what we have in common? What is different? Um, and I'm going to show you some application of that uh, a little bit forward. So we have our specification 
that we developed by comparing um, a lot of different outputs. Um, so in the end, we had to cre create a list of AMR prediction tools that we wanted to work on. Um, then one thing that came out of that, out of necessity, was a way to actually obtain the results from these tools without having to run them one by one using a singular data set. So we developed a workflow called the harmonization workflow, which basically compiles all of these tools into a single workflow. You input your data, context reads, and then it outputs the, the reports of all of those tools, which then we can use our harmonization package to actually harmonize the results into a singular standard format. Um, which is not tool, tool, uh, tool specific. Uh, this, is, this is possible thanks to the standardized output specification. And really this is the backbone of the whole project is because we have the specification, we are able to map these fields. So in the end, the optimization package automates the conversion of a standardized output where tools can be built on. So this is an overview of how harmonization works. You're gonna have your upstream genomic workflow. Uh, fast, you can do quality control on your reads. You can do your assembly, quality control on your assembly, and you're gonna feed them to whatever gene detection uh, software you choose using whatever uh, AMR database um, you want. Um, in my experience, run them all if you can. Uh, and the idea is then that harmonization can actually take the reports of each of every single tool that is listed here um, and outputs a standardized AMR gene report that then can be passed on to knowledge users. So what actually this entails? Uh, so the standardized specification uh, is the backbone and improves the data harmonization and interoperability implemented in our uh, harmonization tool, which is a command line tool I'm sorry, it's not uh, pretty UI yet. I don't know if we have plans in the future to improve that, uh, uh, but it's also BioPython compatible. So you can actually import it. It's not uh, currently available on BioPython, but we do have plans on actually implementing it there. So the use can be facilitated. So the harmonization workflow is available on GitHub. If you wanna take a look at it, instructions on how to use it are available there. But the idea is very simple. You have a data set, a sample or many samples, and then we have a pretty little box that's powered by SnakeMake. This is our workflow manager, uh, workflow software manager that we choose to develop this in that actually takes advantage of Conda to download um, a, a stable version of the tools. And then it basically outputs it gives you back all the reports from those tools and you don't need to actually run them all independently and manually. Uh, so this ensures that the results that you have are reproducible and scalable, meaning that you can analyze one sample or you can analyze a whole data set of them. Um, so the inclusion criteria for the harmonization at this time and in this stage is AMR gene detection. So it has to be a tool specific for NMR gene, gene detection. And I have an emphasis on the gene because there is a lot of debate now and a lot of talk of the importance of the mutation. And this is something that I will definitely cover in a little bit. Another criteria is for them to be open source. The harmonization package, so sort of takes the, all of the collection of the outputs and is a Python uh, powered tool and gives you back a standardized format. So right now, I think this is not 14, but actually 15, but I'll go into that deeper. So it takes around uh, 14 different spe species agnostic AMR margin detection tools. And then it provides you with a report. There is a lot of people working on this project and their contributions are uh, extremely valuable. And I would like to give knowledge to them. Um, we ensure that the harmonization package has a validation. So we have included testing to ensure that we are actually parsing the, the several outputs correctly. And for example, if uh, a report for tool changes from one version to the other, we actually know about it because we're gonna have an error on our automated testing. 
Um, and the spec is actually implemented as a JSON and a solid schemata. Uh, so it's basically a dictionary-like structure that contains all the fields and how to map them. Um, so I'm not going to dwell a lot, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this is definitely going to be covered by Finley in a little bit. But the idea is that, for example, you can take an example of a report from Abricate. Uh, so you call Armonize Abricate. Each one of the supported tools has a different, um, it's going to be called by its, by its name. So if here we have Abricate, we'd be calling RGI or AMR Finder Plus. Um, you give them the report, the database version. This is metadata that it's not included in the report um, and we need to know it. And you give them the output and say in what format you want your output to be on. Um, then you can combine all the harmonized reports into one. And this is extremely useful. So you can have a table. JSON is for the more programmatic people, but you can either have a table that you can import to Excel and then explore, or more interesting, you can have an interactive HTML that you can explore. So looking at the interactive HTML, um, one thing that is obvious here is that we have one, two, three, four, five different tools. And you can see that you have different number of hits for the same sample. So each row is a sample, each column is a different um, tool. Uh, you can have the same tool with different um, configurations. So you can actually, you can have like two runs of abricates. Um, it's just going to be abricate config one, abricate config two. So you can actually see the, the results of each one of individual runs. Maybe you change some parameters. Maybe you change your database and you want to see the impact of that. Um, because you can have different numbers of hits, uh, the, the rows are collapsed. And if you want to check which gene you actually have, you can click on one. Um, and then you can see the IDs of the, um, the hits that you had for that particular sample using that particular software with that particular configuration. If you like to try this out for yourself, there's actually a demo available so you can just put this link i might drop it in the chat in a little bit um and then you can actually explore by yourself how our harmonized uh interactive report actually looks like one th another additional thing is you can select uh genes of interest so for example here i'm interested in phosph phosph phosphomycin resistance i'm looking for phos a uh, gene you can see that it was detected by four out of the five. So CSTAR actually missed it. And you can click compare. And you're going to have the table that actually contains our standardized spec. And you can have, uh, you're going to have the, the values filled out for each entry in our specification. Uh, you can see a static image of it here. And you can clearly see that some, uh, depending on the methods, uh, some fields are going to be empty, while others are going to be filled. For example, the, here we have a query starts, which is particular for amino acid sequence and then nucleotide, because all of these uses a nucleotide uh, database. We report just the nucleotide here. Um, so this allows us to actually compare if the result that we have is the same, or if the coordinates that we have of that result is the same, if the identity reported by each of the tools is the same. Um, so you can actually see, for example, here we have a slight variation of the sequence identity because there are different methods that are applied. Uh, and this is actually very important for you to actually validate if the that tool using that database is working well for your species of interest. So take, take home message number three. Harmonization allows dissemination of the results to stakeholders in a single consistent format. And that was our goal, to have a single consistent format. Uh, because there is no one database that's better than the other. There is no one tool that's better than the other. You have caveats, you have specialization in each. So we want to have a single format so we'll be able to compare and to share the results. Um, I have a few data sets that, uh, as an example, that's Thanks to wonderful collaborations. 
Uh, so, for example, Elizabeth from the McMaster University ran um, our harmonization software. Uh, she had a data set of 89 groups yellow pneumonia sequence data. Um, and the tools that she ran was RGI using WASP and CAR database. RGI uh, bow tie, this was still in beta version at the time, using, so this was a read based method, while well, this is a, a county based method. Um, still using CAR database, she had RMR Finder Plus using BLAST, Blast X, so it translates to, to protein, um, and their DB, and the REST Finder using BLAST N plus the REST Finder BD, uh, DB. And you can actually see that depending on the method, and sometimes, so depending on the method, depending on the database, which for example, we have BLAST, there, there are different flavors of BLAST, but you still have different results on the total number of unique genes that you obtain. Um, and this is something to be very aware of. You can have different results, different, uh, each tool can implement different cutoff values. Uh, sometimes they are exposed to you through parameterization, other times they're not. Um, and so there is very something that you should be aware of and something that harmonization allows you to actually see very explicitly is that you might have a different number. You have, might have a very different sens sensitivity um, to uh, in your data set using uh, a particular tool. Another one, which was called uh, a bad example, uh, and actually I agree with that, um, is was uh, Dr. Adam Whitney from the St. George University of London uh, ran uh, a myriad of, uh, he ran Advocates, AMR Finder Plus, He Star, REST Finder, and Star AMR uh, on a data set of 87 Pseudomonas aeruginosa sequence data. And here the results are presented to you in a heat map. This was a well characterized data set. It's published and publicly available. Actually, this is the data set that is currently on our demo of the, re the interactive report. So they knew phenotypically that 73 of the 87 um, isolates uh, had a VIM2 that carried resistance uh, phenotype. So this was validated phenotypically, and they also did for the paper analysis uh, in silico. So using these tools, we were actually looking for that VIM gene. And one curious thing, I don't know if you can actually see if your screen is too small, I apologize, but you have a blah VIM and a blah VIM2. Um, they're the same <laughs> um, in this data set. But one thing that you can see is that because you have more hits um, using, so if you have for the same gene, five different tools reporting the same thing, you're going to have more confidence in that result. So this can actually be a measure of confidence on the calls that you're actually doing. So antimicrobial resistance is not driven solely by the position of genes. This is something that was very brought up. Um, so the variation through mutation represents a major component of the acquisition of a resistance phenotype. And this is something that was not uh, initially envisioned for harmonization. We developed a, a specification for the uh, detection of genes, and particularly we're interested in the AMR um, genes, but we cannot ignore the fact that mutations are driven. And in some cases, for example, TB, uh, the majority of the resistant phenotype is driven by mutations, not acquisition of genes. Uh, if we have uh, an overview of the mechanisms uh, of resistance and what confers genetically that resistance is not only the gene acquisition. Mutations are an important and essential part of the, the acquisition of resistance that should not be ignored. So a word of caution, this is very much work in progress. Um, it is something that was extremely, uh, it was advanced quite a lot during our AMR hackathon. And for that, I think to all the contributors, um, but we want to expand our specification to include these uh, variant types. So this required some changes, both to our specification, which is the underlying source of truth for the harmonization package. 
Um, so we took our gene detection standard and we added to it a mutation detection standard. So now we have a combined version that englobes everything. Additional terms were added. One of the most important ones is the generic variant type, mutation 14. Uh, predicted phenotype, the confidence level, if it's a nucleotide mutation, uh, the interpretation of that nucleotide mutation, because it might not be very clear if you have just like a cigar string, uh, protein mutation and interpretation in a recognizable way of that um, change, and the frequency of the variant. And I do believe that frequency of the variant is very important because sometimes, as mentioned by, uh, by Michael, one can interpret error as a variation, and that is a very important. So if you have a frequency, if you have like 80% of your reads actually have that mutation, you can be more confident that it's actually not a sequencing error that you're actually seeing. Again, down uh, upstream uh, quality uh, assurance and quality control of your data is always extremely important when you're dealing with prediction. Um, an important component here is the interpretation of the variants. So for that, we use a sequence variant nomenclature. So it is a system that allows you to denote a variation using a very defined schema, but it's very hard for your human to read. Um, and so we have an automated way to translate that into something that is comprehensible by someone who's reading that report. Uh, and this is actually, it lives at its own tool and the GitHub is here if you want to watch, want to take a look. Um, but as now our very first um, uh, case, a uh, TB profiler was added to the harmonization um, list of allowed tools with this new schema. Jody, who's a developer of the TB profiler, actually was the person responsible for that and Connor uh, help with the translation of the what is the variation to something that is actually comprehensible. So, for example, we're going to have a variation type which is a protein mutation, uh, and here the nucleotide we have this thing, which I cannot tell you what it says, but thanks to Connor's tool, we can say that it's, it's a substitution found in the RPOB at the position 1,349, where the reference has a C and the sample has a T. So this is what it actually takes from this, uh, this string. Uh, from the same, th same type, we can have the same type of interpretation for protein mutation. This is the code using that standard that I mentioned before, and the interpretation that we can have. It's amino acid substitution in the same position, in the same gene at position 450, because we're talking about amino acids, think string. Uh, where the reference has a serine and the sample has a leucine. So this actually is a protein a mutation in the, in the genome that actually confers a mutation in the protein, because sometimes mutation can be silent. Uh, and of course, we have the frequency of the variants. So it's a little bit over half of the, the total reads that confer that. So resistant phenotypes can be not only plasma mediated or due to the presence of pool genes, but also chromosomal mutations. The ability to detect not just the gene presence or absence, but the more granular changes like the mutation is the uttermost importance for a, an efficient public health analysis. And now, one thing that is clearly missing from my talk is I mentioned a lot about the different types of input data that you can have, the bioinformatic pipelines that you can have, and the different types of output that you can have, but you can have different databases. Um, and in a very important way, and this is affects immensely the type of results that you're going to have. So one goal that we have now, and this is, was born sort of from a side project from Anthony Underwood, is to try to harmonize um, resistance databases. And we started with three. We have CART, the NCBI resistance database, and REST Finder from the TU. Uh, there's, again, this was work done during the hackathon. Uh, and a lot of was advanced, and uh, I want to acknowledge everyone, but we have the Charmed, uh, which is the tool responsible for this harmonization. Uh, a thing that I would really like to bring attention to you, this is uh, a graph that has sequence identity in the x-axis, and then it has name similarity. 
So a question here is, if I have the same sequence, do they have different names? And the answer is very much yes. You can see here that you have sequences that are very similar, ones that are, that are completely identical, but the name similarity is very different. And before someone asks, uh, species names were removed for the, from the identifier because that sometimes can show up in different databases. So we tried to normalize and clean up the names as much as possible. So we are making a fair comparison. For example, sometimes you can have a vim gene or a blah vim. We remove the blah part. Um, uh, the idea here now is then that for the three databases, a comparison of all sequences against all sequences was done. And that information with a blast like uh, system, it was MMSIC. And the information on the identity and coverage was stored in a graph. This is very nerdy stuff, and I apologize for that. Uh, but this is the underlying structure that is feeding charmed. It's a graph network that basically has for each node. It has a relationship to another that includes the coverage and the identity. identity. Um, and you have for each node represents a sequence in a database. What's the ID? Where is that database? Um, what is the phenotype? If you have metadata, it's going to be presented here. For example, for NCBI, we have phenotype and the product. And for cards, we have, of course, the ontology which is extremely useful, um, also in the phenotype. And we actually can compare that the both annotations are different or if they are the same. So you can use this either with gene names, if you specify database, you can use this either with gene names or uh, accessions numbers. And for example, I wanna know this gene, the key NR B2, what are the closest in the other two databases? This is from NCBI. So if I run CharmDB on that, CharmDB query, um, it's going to give me a very colorful and pretty output, very unlike traditional bioinformatics uh, command line tools, uh, where you can actually see from the cart, which is the closest hit, and you can tell that the identity is not 100%. Uh, but you have, for example, what is the, the paper that actually supports that resistance for this entry uh, and annotation. So the, the, the ontology session and what phenotype it confers. And for REST finder, you have the same. In this case, the identity and the coverage is one. So it's a uh, perfect match. Uh, and it says as a phenotype, it confers resistance to, I'm horrible at saying, uh, antibiotic names. So cyprofloxacin, I'm very much a bioinformatics. <laughs> so our goal now is to integrate Charmed into harmonization because why not harmonize all the things if we can? Um, so we want to include, one thing that Charmed allows is that if you run uh, harmonized and you have a report that combines all your runs using, so first you use harmonized, for example, for Abricate, you have your reports for different versions of Abricate that you have. You can summarize and harmonize everything into um, a summary, like the table and the interactive report. It can actually output a JSON and Charm can take that TSV or the JSON and actually, outputs um, the results as a TSV file. The thing that we did during the hackathon was take this, this, um, this TSV file that actually has all in which sample, what hits do you have uh, and what are the closest matches in the other databases. So for example, if in this particular sample was run using MCBI database, this is a gin hit that I had if you actually were able to scroll that direction, you would see the relevant hits uh, for in the other two databases, so for cards and for REST finder. Um, but an idea here, we want to visualize that graph so you can actually select one of the hits and you can actually see here the graph and what are the hits that are closest to it. 
So now we have an interactive report and the idea in the future is that maybe we can integrate both and have for now for our harmonized output reports, we can have the, the, the hits for the harmonization from the software. So is the comparable and from the hits itself, we can actually click them and see what are the closest uh, sequences in the databases, at least for these three. Um, so take home message number five, uh, a unified global picture requires not only a common ground for the comparison of the results from the tools, but a common ground for the comparison of the databases that are used to generate those results. And the databases plays a huge influence on the results that you can have. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. I thank you all um, for your attention. And if you want to reach out, my email is right here. Also my Twitter, very fast to, to answer on there. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the Data Structures work group from FAGE, information or email, of course, we're on Twitter and our website is here. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Inez. Really great talk covering a large amount of new and some difficult topics, including, uh, yeah, you know, often you get a talk that contains results that were generated uh, within two days before the talk. Oh yeah, two uh, days. <laughs> always, always impressive. Okay, let's, let's hit some questions. Um, are we planning on, uh, are you planning on implementing other workflow managers use harmonization in the future? Like an NF core module or a snake make, like, you know, implement are it. Are you like talking that? about the, the, actually the thing that feeds the results to harmonization? Because harmonization is currently a standalone tool. Uh, okay. Are you talking about our, to convert our snake mail workflow into another flavor? It is basically, is there a plan to try and uh, integrate harmonization into kind of workflow tools and modules to make it easier for people to use in their own workflows? And I will discuss right. the difference between running things in the command line and workflows in my next talk. <laughs> yeah, in the future, yes. Uh, we're going to have a lot of overlap here. Um, honestly, I don't think there is a, a plan now to do that, but it, that's a great suggestion and would definitely take notice of that. Um, this is uh, an effort of many people in a work group, uh, and we always uh, welcome people who want to join and maybe collaborate with us and agilizing the implementation of this into other mediums. See, plugging page here. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things with CharmDB is, yeah, this, I'm kind of related to Dr. Sang's talk where we're talking about these different databases. Why is it very challenging to harmonize across databases? What are some of the difficulties of actually doing that? And why can't you just stick it all together and do some clustering like some databases do? You know, very, being very nice with the questions. So um, it was very much brought forward and that you can have very close hit and not being a gene that actually confers resistance. So we cannot actually just, this is a very crude approach in my, in my opinion, it's a caveat. It's, it's a way to get to a mean, but it's a crude approach because we are blasting sequences directly with one another and they might not be the same thing. Um, very small differences in nucleotides can confer a very different phenotype. And that when we are trying to harmonize, do we harmonize by name? Uh, each database can have their own conver conversion, uh, convention for naming um, a resistant gene. Um, if we harmonize by sequence, we need to be very aware of these types of caveats. If we just blast them together and say that, okay, this is the closest hit. One, it might have the same metadata, it might not be the same thing. And also we don't want to step on toes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and and again, and uh, Dr. Feldgarden kind of touched on it as well with the, um, the one rule for all versus custom rules for different AMR gene families. Very but, much. Uh, you can but, have specialized databases for particular, for example, DB, <laughs> for particular organism. And is it fair to actually compare with a very agnostic and broad spectrum database? Um, the level can, of granularity that you can have in one is very different from the other. Harmonization is not very simple. Mm. And and a lot of like a lot of those challenges come down to the literature that all these databases are built on. Like they can't, they're not they're not doing all these experiments themselves. They're drawing on this grand literature that hopefully by the end of today, many of you will be even better equipped to contribute towards. But like yes. for example, you know you have the NDM 
uh, beta lactamases, which differ right. by one to two alleles for diff- one to do amino acids, it gets a whole different allele name. Whereas then you have things like, I don't know, MCRs, which each allele encompasses a lot larger area of diversity. So dealing, very reconciling much. all those incompatible amounts of diversity can be very, very challenging. And that's before we even touch on to the problem of variant based resistance and harmonizing them exactly. across databases, <laughs> which I know and- is there's some aim towards. Have you got any ideas for that? Uh, the harmonization of uh, variants. Yep. Very much work in progress. So you just saw the efforts of a three-day hackathon that unfortunately I was not part particular of this group, but I was amazed with the progress. So this is very much work of Jody and Connor. Um, so we started out with the TV because there's a very comprehensive database for that. Uh, and it's definitely on the plans to include more uh, species specific uh, variant databases so that we can global more uh, having a report that actually so now that we have the spec so this is the underlying source of truth um, on how we can compare different reports having the spec the introduction of uh, a new tool that relies on the identification of variants it's just a matter of creating a parser and adding that to our command line utility so maybe we can agilize that a little bit <laughs> well i think that relates to one of the questions uh so there's the question of will there be another workshop or hackathon? I think after the success of the workshop, both the, the hackathon and obviously and also the engagement in this training work training workshop, I think we would definitely be interested in doing it again in the future. Yes, um, the engagement has been quite amazing. And also, yeah, and the amount of stuff that's coming at the hackathon, for example. Um, how do people how would people take part in crowdsource development further? How could they contribute to some of these projects and initiatives? So one thing that's very useful is that all our projects is open source. So nothing stops anyone for going to our repository and contribute. Um, if you want to, we have instructions for how you can actually contribute to the project in the README. So it's very much welcome to anyone. If they are interested in a particular tool that we missed, please contribute if you have the know-how. If you don't, you can always create an issue and say, I would really like to have this tool featured and we certainly get to it. Not promising when, but we'll get to it. <laughs> um, great. Um, is there a way to specify, harmonize, summarize, generate all the different output formats? So JSON, TSV, and interactive formats in one go? I don't think so, but maybe yeah. we should. <laughs> yeah, we, we can we can definitely add we that can do feature. That. Yeah, uh, just have an all. And it fortunately, fortunately it is relatively quick. So it, yes. you probably can just run it three times without much of a problem, but uh, yeah, we can definitely. Uh, but maybe and if you're interested in that, you can raise it on the repo as, a, as an yes. issue if you wish. Um, is there a plan to build a GUI for users to upload data to run these, uh, run these uh, harmonization and uh, charm tools? Good question. So that actually requires a whole lot of um, resources. So we would have to have a server for that and actually have to re-implement the tool as a GUI for that. Um, maybe it's a good issue to create. Um, definitely contributions are always welcome because this is a working group and this is not the main job of anyone who's present there. Uh, but I, I see that making it used more easy to use by someone who's not very um, well versed on the command line, and I know that the command line can be scary. Um, is it's a great advantage, uh, but as you'll see from Finn's demo, it's really not that hard. Um, and, and and the problem is, with the exception of really, I think pretty much ResFinder and uh, RGI with Card, you you probably will have to use the command line to run a lot of these tools. Yeah. Yeah, so, most of them are command line based, and that's sort of like still the standard. Hmm. Um, so if you want to have like a very expensive uh, sort of results, you, eventually you're going to have to deal with the command line. Uh, but it's it's it looks scarier than it is. Just a lot of black and white, <laughs> but it doesn't hurt very much. Can harmonization be used on the Galaxy platform? Um, so people who are not familiar with the command line can use it. I think so. Now we have actually a model there. Yep. Um, it was a fairly recent addition from... Tan, Tan Liviet from uh, yes. Andrew Page's group. Uh, exactly, apologies. he's here. Uh, 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 implemented a Galaxy wrapper for it. So it can be used on the Galaxy platform if you have workflows on there. 
I don't think it's currently integrated into any like larger workflows, but it's easy. It's in the tool shed, so you can use it from there. Um, let's see. Lots of good, there's lots of great questions. Um, That's a good sign. Yeah, no, there's been lots of great engagement. Um, it's an interesting one, especially related to Charmed. Uh, how much would you, how much machine learning is there in uh, AMR genomics, met genomics? And uh, I don't know. <laughs> there, I can, I'm happy to have, take this one if you're. Uh, yes, you're please, because like, I'm I'm yeah. really not comfortable comfortable saying how much. I know there are tools that actually implement that. So yeah, there there are there is a lot of use, and especially in the problem, and we'll talk about it, I think in the panel discussion further of that problem of linking the genome to phenotype and trying to make those predictions. Um, yep. Yeah, then there's a variety of some include graphs, some use like pan genomics. So on and. There's lots, lots of different ways that graph networks, et cetera, are being used for those things. Currently, I don't think there's any real plans to use them for the Charmed or Reconciling and Charmed. Um, no. uh, the, 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 the trick with machine learning is knowing when and where, when to use it and when not to use it. And sometimes it can be a little bit scary in the world of uh, something that can be as clinically important as antibiotic resistance, because you yes, don't want it. You need at least when you're using something like machine learning, you, be, you need to be very aware of the biases because every model is going to have a bias. You just need to ensure that the bias actually align with what you want to predict. Uh, and given that this is AMR and prediction of resistance, um, those are scary. At least they're scary. <laughs> okay, here, here's, a, here's a great question that ties into your, uh, your expertise beyond just AMR. But so if we have a bunch of metagenomic reads, how can we like determine the species that are present in there? And what kind of analyses can we do with those metagenomic reads? That's a very, that, that could be a whole workshop because you can do a lot. You can do read-based read -based methods. So you can, for example, either what we call clustering or binning the reads into what they are most similar and then try to class classify those bins. So you try to isolate the reads that belong to a single genome, you can classify directly the reads, for example, with software like Kraken, which runs uh, a Kimer. Kimers are great when you have a lot of data. Uh, so you're going to have like a, an overview of, if you have a reference database of taxonomical data, uh, you can actually do just a simple comparison of your read set with what you have on your database and have a, like an overview of the genes that you have. You're not recovering any of them, you just have a picture of the diversity that you have there. Um, if you go through assembly-based methods, there are assemblers that are specific to handle metagenomics. And the reason why they are better suited for that is because they try to solve variation. Instead of assuming it's an error, they, they assume variation. It actually belongs to the, to the sample. So it might represent that you have very similar uh, genomes there. Um, and another thing is that coverage might be an indicator of abundance. So you can have different species in your sample of different abundance, and they're going to actually take that into consideration into their assembly input. And having the contigs, which are larger sequences, sequences, so you can have a lot more information there. You can try to either classify them, for example, a blast. You can blast all the sequences and see what you have from your uh, on from the reference that you use, and, and try to classify them that way. Um, and you can try to bin those uh, those sequences, those larger sequences like you can do with the reads and try to separate individual genomes and then try to characterize. But there is a big caveat when you're working with metagenomic data is that uh, you can know who's there, you can know what they're doing. For example, if there is a resistance there, if there's a virulence factor, but the biggest challenge with metagenomic data is knowing who's doing what because the context of you can have gene presence and absence of a certain resist, uh, resistance, but aligning that to a, a, a taxa, it's very, very challenging. And I, uh, I hope I, I gave a good answer. Yeah, that was very fantastic. Complex question. Yeah, no, and as, as Inez says, this, is a, this could be a workshop all of itself just for AMR, let alone for all the other types of genomic analyses. I would just say one caveat and one thing to be very careful of when using metagenomics is 
because of the challenges of the kind of sequences and the coverage of mobile genetic elements, such as plasmids and genomic islands, they can be very hard to, I mean, they're hard to assemble in genomes, but that problem is even more difficult in metagenomes. And the next level of if you're trying to group those, your metagenome assemblies into individual species, it almost they're doesn't vanished. work at all. So you're going to, if you care about AMR associated with mobile gene, uh, like mobilized AMR, you need to be very careful using it, using metagenomics, because it can very easily just, you can end up, and I've done, I've done experiments, I can share the paper in the chat, where basically we find there's, we got zero of the AMR genes associated with mobile genetic elements recovered. I also did the same experiment and the same result using yeah. Illumina or Longread. Uh, we have phenotypic data that there's a resistance there, we isolated from, it was a fecal sample. Everyone works with fecal samples on metagenomics. It's the law of the land. Um, but when we actually did shotgun metagenomic sequences, because they were on mobile elements, they completely vanished from the data set. Uh, unfortunately, this is not public work. Um, another well, thing that I would like to bring attention, I'm sorry, Finn, no? um, it's contamination. And that is an important, if you're working with AMR, you're probably working with clinical samples, you're going to have human contamination. Um, so most of probably most of what you will be sequencing is actually human reads. Um, so either you sequence very deep and it gets extremely expensive um, or the lo lowest abundance um, phenotype um, taxa and mobile elements are very prone to this are going to disappear from the sample. So you're not going to know what they're there. And there's, there are there are ways around it, but then you, this are. gets more and more complex on the wet lab side. So sort of bait capture experiments, which can create their own biases. So this is where you're trying to basically Very selectively so. selectively capture AMR related things. And another way is that has some promise for recovering MGEs associated with their correct species and chromosome is uh, high C and some of the some of the yeah. cross linking methods. So it basically cross links all the DNA inside the cells mm -hmm. before they all get split up and we sequence everything. But they are again a whole other workshop worth of methods to talk about. So I think that's that's us up to um, the end of Inez's talk. And you're going to be around for some panel discussion later. I will. Um, sure. So we're going to we're going to take a ten minute break, a twenty minute break, um, just to let everyone breathe and have a uh, have a calm <laughs> have a calm after that whirlwind of uh, talks. That was a lot back to back, I imagine. Um, and then I'm going to come in and give a very very brief, very high level demo of a lot of the things people have talked about today. And uh, like Dr. Felgarden and Inez, Inez Mendez especially have done like some nice. Uh, like have shown you what the command line instructions would actually look like to do these things. So I'm just going to go back through that. There is also a Git repo that I put together um, that I will post again in chat that basically contains everything I'm everything I'll be talking about and in kind of more detail and more uh, more detail. And you can do it at your own pace with all the instructions and some simple implementations. So feel free to follow along with that if that's helpful. And if there's any questions or whatever, you can always make an issue. If something doesn't make sense on that later on. Okay, so see everyone back here in 20 minutes. <laughs>